Hi there, my name is Betsy Woodruff. This is Woodruff and Strauss, and our guest today, unfortunately, horrible news, really sorry about this, guys, is my least favorite DC journalist, Aslan Subsang of the Daily Beast. Just kidding, he's not actually my least favorite. Um, but, uh, here he is. He's a dear friend, and... <laughs> and I'll, I'll see you in hell, Betsy. <laughs> um, Swin has... A, kind of an unusual beat for DC reporters because he focuses a lot on pop culture um, and how it intersects with politics. So he has kind of a atypical body of work, which is interesting and important. But uh, but that's not why you dislike Nick. <laughs> so I dislike him for purely purpose, purely personal reasons. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm delighted to have you, Swin. So excited about the that's next deep. 40 minutes of my life. Uh, That's any... how long you're keeping me for this? <laughs> any introductory comments? Any background on you people should know? Essential Swin Soup saying facts? Um, uh, I'm a Thai American. Uh, I used to work at Mother Jones Magazine for three years, and now I'm at thedailybeast.com. <laughs> cool. Everything you need to know. Uh, all the basics. It's great. So I love long walks on the beach, and... <laughs> Good. I'm a, I'm a dog person. That's valuable. What's your sign? I forget. What we... <laughs> okay, well, never mind. We won't, we won't get into that. Okay. Um, so, typically, for, for a long time, Woodruff and Strauss listeners, typically we focus on D.C. politics uh, during election season. We'd have like a very specific rundown of states we were going to talk about or races we were going to talk about. Um, Swin and I don't really have a controlling theme for the next, the next few minutes of your time. Um, this is mostly kind of smorgasbord grab bag of topics, but I think it'll be fun. It's all, all important things. <coughs> so the first thing that we wanted to talk about today is Nazis because Nazis are in the news, which is not, is not normal. Um, the house passed a bill this afternoon, a uh, 420 to zero. An, an amazing show of bipartisanship called the No Social Security for Nazis Act. Uh, Which is of, the best name. Of a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's I probably remember. the most honestly titled legislation that Congress has ever passed. That's exactly what it does. Because, and, and the reason that we need to pass legislation to keep Nazis from getting Social Security, um, for, those, for those of you who have not been closely following the uh, Nazi Social Security narrative, is that AP released a big investigation, I think in October, about the fact that the uh, because of sort of a loophole in our immigration law, the Department of Justice Nazi hunters, could, who, whose job it was to get Nazis to leave the United States, could basically tell former members of the German Nazi party, if you leave on your own, you'll keep getting social security checks. Um, and as a result, you have a number of Nazis leaving America, moving to other countries. You know, the example they give is this one former Auschwitz guard who lives on his $1,500 a month social security check in like a nice village in Croatia, uh, who are just raking in cash from the U.S. government, essentially getting paid not to be in the country. Um, and this is not totally news. Uh, 15 years ago, Congress tried to pass legislation essentially called the No Social Security for Nazis Act, although different name. Um, but the, the branch of the Department of Justice tasked with getting rid of the Nazis opposed it. They said they wanted this extra leverage to get people to leave. It made it easier for them to get them to leave instead of going through kind of protracted denaturalization and deportation process. So here we are. Uh, what do you think about Nazis, twin? Pro or con? I'm just kidding. I, well, generally speaking. <laughs> contra. But, uh, but first of all, I think we should just point out like how much more so unusual, more so than usual, this story having to do with Congress really does sound like an Onion article, not something you would have read in Reuters, which is totally. where I first read it. Totally. Like, not only is the thing called the No Social Security <laughs> or Nazis Act, but as our good friend Matt Ford, who works at the Atlantic, pointed out, um, it passed four twenty. To nothing and 420 whose birthday is 420 what does Hitler. it mean what does it mean i know i can't believe all of this it's all coming together and the uh uh no it's just 
it, it's good that this is something everyone can get behind. It is. It's kind of heartening. It's sort of I heartwarming. Really, I, I really was thinking to myself, when this get, heads to the Senate, as it will do at an unspecified date, uh -huh. since you're sort of the master at covering Congress far more than I am. Comparatively speaking. What's the chance, if you had to pick one member who would vote against the no social security for Nazis, <laughs> who would that be? And I, I don't mean that. <sighs> Good question. You the know, wing in Congress. so I was sort of surprised that nobody in the House voted against it. I almost thought one of the Libertarians or Justin Amash would vote against it, sort of on grounds that it's a thought crime or it's unfairly taking benefits from Americans without trial or that these guys have due process. Like they're only suspected Nazis. They're not right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, but it's true, I think. Yeah. Like yeah. these people yeah. haven't been through a trial. I don't, I don't know that. I'm not sure exactly what the process is like. I was expecting, I was expecting there to be a couple no votes. Um, yeah. So the fact I mean, that I, I was a little bit surprised too because there are these bills like the Rosa Parks was so great bill <laughs> back, and like a couple of people voted against it on yeah. purely technical or as you were saying, like conservative or libertarian principles. Right, yeah. Not, you know, you have Ron Paul who would just vote no on all sorts of things. And you have all this legislation that was one vote away from being unanimous. And when mm -hmm. Ron Paul was in Congress, he'd say, well, I agree with your ends, but the <coughs> Constitution doesn't say we have the power to do that, so we're not doing it. Right. Which? So I, I, I agree with you. I was expecting is, there to be something. Is Congress getting boring, Swim? Is it getting is square? Uh, are they people are, afraid to take a stand? I, I don't know. I, I just asking some questions. And in its uh, in its advanced age, I don't know. So I know, keep but an eye ho on. hopefully. But back to my earlier question: Do you have any guess of if there were one person in the Senate who would vote against this? Who would be? I and mean, I, if the, if there was one person who'd vote against it on sort of the thought crime grounds, that would be Rand Paul. But yeah, but no, he's not going to happen. Not um, a I can't think of anyone who would. I mean, who wants to, <laughs> unless you want to explain to your constituents why you voted for Nazis to get Social Security. Right. It's, it's. <laughs> why you took a principled stand. <laughs> it's just like, it's just it's amazing. It's really amazing. Uh, we, we live in a fast, just fascinating moment. How, how long is this bill? Only is a couple like, pages. I, I read through most of it yesterday. It made it to two pages. <laughs> Only a couple. I think it's, it's like less than four or five. Yeah. Oh God! I was hoping this was gonna be like uh, like a half sentence. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. I thought this was gonna be like <laughs> a good bill that was also a crime against grammar. The or... title of the bill is the bill. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It was. It's, it was like a. It's like a legit bill. They explain where they're amending legislation. I think it amends the Social Security Act, maybe. Um, so I... this is how they privatize Social Security. <laughs> this is yeah. how they get it through the back door. <laughs> They're like, oh, what, what? You don't, you don't want to privatize social security and be against national. <laughs> why are you a Nazi? Yeah, why, why do you support national socialism? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Say what you will about national socialism. At least it's an ethos. But uh, regardless, it's it's definitely if it's just a fun piece of legislation, and I think it's always fun to see when everyone can agree on something, and yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I have any closing thoughts on the on the whether or not Nazis should get Social Security line. Do you have any closing thoughts on it? Any any perspective historically on Nazi hunting or uh, well, two things. Uh, one, I hope that when Obama eventually signs this thing, he has like a huge, epic, wonderful signing ceremony. Pres That's I mean, not presuming he signs it, which we don't know, he might. That is true. We, we don't know. We, I don't think anybody's ever asked Barack Obama's position on Nazis. I don't, I don't know. Just another example about <laughs> the press did not vet him during the 2000s. Lapdog media. <laughs> oh, mm, bastards. But, uh, and historical perspective on Nazi hunting. Well, aside from the ones that we kicked out of our backyards in the United States, uh, where else did they really flee to after World War II ended? Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. And they found some uh, good shelter under the Perón regime, and then following that, the brutal military junta head by General Videla in the 70s. 
during the American Back Dirty War. You know, you know, another bright spot in American history. <laughs> and uh, I think news broke a few days ago, a couple of days ago, that one of the top aides to Eichmann uh, just died in Syria. Yeah. I mean, not that there was not enough going on in Syria right now. <laughs> now they have to have, like, Nazis dying all over the place. Like that. Amazing. So. I, I, think, I think what I find most interesting about this legislation is the fact that they tried to pass it 15 years ago. And I think it's called the Office for Special Investigations. I know, I know, the, I know the acronym is OSI, <coughs> which is the branch of the Department of Justice responsible for Nazi hunting, actually said, no, we have to be able to give Nazis social security to get them out of the country. That's, that's what's really striking to me about this, is that for 15 years we were deliberately giving Nazis social security. And now what? all of a sudden people are like, what? But uh, there aren't, I mean, most of, most of the Nazis are yeah. died of old age. Like, I mean, that is, that is fascinating. But uh, can you explain to me and our viewers why, why they had to do that? You couldn't just arrest them and deport them to, like, stand trial internationally or in Israel or, or something like why, why, why do we have to bribe them to get them out of the country? Why can't we just like send them to get prosecuted? I so. mean, it's complicated, right? It takes a while to, to go through all the legal proceedings. It's expensive. Um, the idea of, of rounding these guys up and sending them to international court, like obviously that's not incredibly difficult or, or it's not incredibly difficult to do for like your top guys, you know, your Eichmann types. But you think about the number of people who were prison guards or were involved in rounding up Jews. Like, that's a lot. There's a, there's a ton of these guys. And the, the cost that it would have taken, I think, to, to find each of them, to get evidence for each of them, to send them all to the ICC, like, could have been prohibitive. Um, especially given that, like, there's a finite amount of time you can spend going after war criminals. And unfortunately, there's a lot of war criminals. So the, the OSI's main goal was just to get these guys out of the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't even necessarily to, like, get them justice. Uh, and that meant sometimes saying, hey, please leave our country. We'll keep giving you Social Security. So very weird. It's kind of a, kind of a weird, weird bureaucratic yeah. moment. Um, but, hey, cool. Hooray for a, well, assuming the Senate passes it and the president signs it. Hooray yeah. for, a, for an end to that, although a little late in the game. I mean, yeah, you could argue that way more taxpayer dollars are currently going to worse causes than giving <laughs> retirement benefits to suspected Nazis who aren't doing anything anymore. I guess that's my edgy, controversial comment. Of the, like, we're still, funding, we're still funding Obamacare. <laughs> I mean, well, we're. I mean, look, we still pay for all sorts of ridiculous stuff. Like uh, Liz Harrington's entire beat at Free Beacon is writing down all the really remarkably unusual things that we spend federal dollars on, like studies on why lesbians tend to be more likely to be to be obese. We spend federal money on that. Uh, we spend federal money on all sorts of weird things. That, that question doesn't make you curious. You don't <laughs> don't want. I I would pay a nickel if I had a choice between so paying taxes this year. And not knowing why or if lesbians are more likely to be obese, I would I would suck it up and I would say, even though my, my curiosity is totally peaked, I would rather not pay taxes. That's just my personal preference. Well, nobody ever wants to pay taxes, but you know. I don't know. I mean, that's not true. People just don't want to pay super high taxes and they don't like the idea that their taxpayer dollars are being spent on things like, why are lesbians fat? Hoo, hoo, hoo. <clears throat> yeah. I think, I think that's a reasonable thing to be upset about. No, 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 no you're, me. you're right. You're, you're right. Tax dollars shouldn't go to that. You're, also, you know, the Iraq War. But <laughs> you, uh, that's a conversation for another episode. Fair enough. So no tax dollars for the Iraq War. Fair. Or, or studies about lesbians' girth. Okay. I guess the interesting point is there's a lot of things we can agree on um, involving tax expenditures. Mm -hmm. And Nazis and Social Security is one. And who knows? Perhaps uh, Bizarro studies on lesbians could be another one. I don't know. Um, with that said, are we ready to move on to our second order of business? We don't get to talk about lesbians and Nazis anymore. <laughs> I'm getting started. I'm getting warmed up, Betsy. <laughs> uh, good. Um, next thing to talk about, which I don't really have a good segue for this. I, I, I try to think of segues, but there's really not one. Because there's not a lot of things. That, speaking of Nazis, let's talk about oh, Hollywood oh. celebs. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of wastes. 
What, what about Hollywood celebrities? About Hollywood celebrities. Well, what I'm a- so glad you're here and then we can have this conversation because of, of reporters on my orbit whose work I follow, I'd say you're the number one expert on Barack Obama's celebrity army. So mm-hmm. can you give us maybe like a 30 second rundown of what the Barack Obama celebrity army is and sure what thing. it does and what it's up to right now? Sure thing. Awesome. Well, the Obama White House uh, has a good number of initiatives that are focused towards um, garnering some more support among top celebrities, particularly in Hollywood, um, in, uh, in order to help get their message out. Uh, a lot of this is run out of the White House's Office of Public Engagement. Uh, for instance, people might remember that Cal Penn, who played Kumar in the Harold and Kumar trilogy, actually worked in the Obama White House's Office of Public Engagement. And what they do is, on uh, initiatives such as selling, uh, selling Obamacare to the American people, or to be more specific, when open enrollment starts, mm-hmm. uh, trying to drum up uh, celebrity or Hollywood support for, um, hey, dumb young people, Sign up for Obamacare. Hey, so stupid you, voters. Yeah, so you have it. Um, they reach out to a lot of famous people to uh, go on social media and make videos or uh, do whatever to get the word out. Um, easy examples to cite are uh, just recently, I think it was a week or two ago, uh, the Obama administration sort of reactivated their pro-Obamacare celeb armada or army, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Junta. Because, yeah. The Obama celebrity <laughs> well, Junta. We'll go with that. Uh, Rolls off the tongue. It, it really does, doesn't it? Uh, because, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, the second period of enrollment for the Affordable Care Act has started up again. So you might have noticed a couple weeks ago there was a flurry of tweets from c- celebrities from Lena Dunham to Sarah Silverman or uh, Cal Penn and Connie Britton. All kinds of people who were sort of involved in the last round of celebrity pro Obamacare outreach. So, do they so time think. when they want celebrities to tweet this? Because obviously, you don't want all your celebrities tweeting on the same day. Mm-hmm. Sign up for open enrollment, right? Do you know? Do you know how coordinated this is? You know, you tweet this day, you tweet this day. I mean, uh, it's how regimented. It's pretty. I'm not sure how regimented it is, but it is pretty coordinated in the sense that. Uh, the day this started happening a couple of weeks ago, it was announced as like the first celebrity day of action or something. Celebrity like that. day of action. I I think I'm getting the exact name of it wrong, but I really hope that's what it's called. It should uh, be called Thinkfluencer Day of Action. Yes. <laughs> celebrity day of thinkfluencing. The the Amy Poehler Thinkfluencer Day of Affordable <laughs> Care Act action. Yes. Uh, so yeah, there is a good deal of people in the White House, like, getting in touch with uh, these celebrities or people who represent these celebrities to essentially say, say, would you like to be a part of this? Um, For a lot of these bleeding heart liberals in Hollywood, it's not too hard to get them to say yes. And it's obviously not that hard for them or someone who works for them to send out a tweet saying, hashtag get covered, open enrollment starts, you should have health care or something simple. Right, yeah. But sometimes this obviously goes beyond just Instagram or Twitter, like sometimes it's more elaborate. Uh, for instance, uh, Funny or Die, which has had a very good relationship with the Obama White House. Um, for the last round of enrollment, uh, there was that, you know, Zach Galifianakis hosts Between Two Ferns, that sort of fake, uncomfortable, funny interview show for Funny or Die. Mm-hmm. There was that episode where he had Barack Obama on. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, at the end of the video, there was actually a link to the to healthcare.gov, and for that day, Funny or Die became like the top uh, referrer for traffic to the Obama really? website. Yeah. Wow. So these things, when done right, they actually do have. I, I'm not saying it's not like this is how Funny or Die saved Obamacare <laughs> uh, and the Obamacare website after its completely disastrous rollout, <laughs> but you know, every bit helps. And this is one way the White House has been actually pretty savvy in terms of motivating star power to go out and say, these things we're doing are good, you should get on board with it. So uh, that's the pro-Obamacare Hollywood junta 
that so gracefully rolls off the tip of my tongue. Any other issues the Hollywood junta has focused on? Uh, or is, well, is it mostly Obamacare? I feel like I've mostly seen them doing Obamacare stuff. A lot of it's been Obamacare. Yeah. Um, is there something to be said, talking about the efficacy of, of the Hollywood junta and looking at that in terms of the midterms? Because I remember during the 2012 <coughs> election, the Hollywood junta, uh, whether, it was, whether it was in an official or a non-official capacity, obviously very strongly favorable with the president's re-election. Uh, and then again, in the midterms, we saw some Hollywood stuff, you know, telling people register to vote, yeah. lots of tweets, the, uh, the Lena Dunham, Lil Wayne, turn out for turn what? Out for what uh, was, turn down for vote? Vote down for what? Huh. Um, I'm 45. Uh, <laughs> is there, You're the given... the first person I know, Betsy. I'm sorry. Super. Thanks. Thank you, friend. Um, given that, given that the the president's party just sort of got walloped. Does that does that suggest that celebrities tweeting things and making YouTube videos might not be as effective as one might think? Um, is there a way you can gauge the efficacy of the celeb junta? Well, uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, you're talking about a couple different things because the celeb junta, when we're talking about uh, people signing up through healthcare.gov, that's completely different than it being sort of a small factor in a Democrat ground game, mm -hmm. which I, I mean, it wasn't going to be effective, period, especially for young people during these midterms. It didn't matter how many videos Lena Dunham and Lil Wayne made together with Rock the Vote. It just wasn't going to happen. Like, midterms suck for Democrats all the time, and th that means it also sucks for, like, youth turnout. So, um, uh, so, no, it, it, it's just a thing that was there. They tried. It got some good publicity. Maybe it got a couple of extra young kids to register to vote this time around. But uh, I don't think anybody was counting on this being a resounding success this year. Besides, obviously, Obama, is there another political figure who seems to have widespread celebrity support? Um, is, do you think, do you, think Hillary there, Clinton. you think so? Well... We're sort of conflating the terms Hollywood and celebrity. I'm, I'm sure, like, but if we're just to talk about Hollywood, because in terms of celebrity money... Let's talk about celebrity. Let's, let's, let's broaden it. Oh, sure, sure. But, I mean, Hollywood's very important, because if we're talking about uh, a, even just all this money that's being pumped into not only uh, the presidential elections, but the midterms, mm -hmm. even though, you know, the liberal... Hollywood elite completely lost. They did pump a good deal of money into like the Alison Lundgren Grimes campaign and other campaigns during the 2014 midterms. Um, Hollywood is where the a huge, like staggering amount of that celebrity money is coming from and influence, of course. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, what is is there another candidate like Obama who has a comparable level of like celebrity slash Hollywood support? Um, do, you I, think, I, do you think Hillary Clinton would get the same amount of Hollywood support if she was president? Like if she had an initiative, do you think the same number of celebrities would show up? Do you think there'd be the same enthusiasm? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? A, she's a Democrat. B, she's a Clinton. It, it doesn't really matter how you or I feel about her. We know that the Clintons are beloved in, among other areas of the entertainment industry, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, a good number of the Hollywood heavy hitters that give a lot of money and actually do sort of call the political shots in that town when it comes to their colleagues and um, 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 fellow entertainers did turn on Hillary Clinton all in pretty rapid succession when Obama, you know, burst on the national stage, more so than he had already had mm -hmm. uh, come the... Oh, a primaries. Uh, but no, I, with the exception of maybe a couple of people, um, I don't see how Hollywood and other liberal celebrity money wouldn't line up directly behind Hillary Clinton, provided she is the nominee. In mm -hmm. um, any other political figures who have sort of outsized Hollywood support? Like Mark Ruffalo was tweeting about ready for Elizabeth Warren today. Yeah, but do you maybe think some. I mean, it, it, if you're 
Let me put this. Are there other celebs who like Bernie Sanders? Um, I'm, not that really come to mind. I, I'm sure if you asked them and if they knew who he was, they'd say nice things about them in s- the same way they'd say nice things about Cory Booker. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of like who is a politician, Democrat or Republican, who has the name recognition and would definitely have the backing of a lot of celebrity money and support. Hillary Clinton is the only one I can think of right now. Hmm. But I don't, I, I don't necessarily, that's a testament to her own personal political star power or, or star attraction, I should say. It's that she just has the most name recognition. Like, yeah. who's the other Democrat? So rock- Democrats are, would you say Hollywood's going to line up whoever the top, behind whoever the top Democratic nominee is? Don't they always? Yeah, basically. Yeah. No news I mean, there. I mean, I guess the interesting thing here isn't like, oh, who are the politicians that have all this kind of Hollywood support? It's just sort of how lazily it has been lined up behind Hillary Clinton. It's sort of like a microcosm of what I guess people would now call the in- the inevitability or perhaps like fragile inevitability of Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Interesting. The fragile yeah. inevitability of Hillary Clinton. Well, maybe less fragile than it was eight years ago. <laughs> That's a good tongue twister. Um, I have one last celebrity DC question. Did Please. you see our, uh, Aaron Schock, who is a congressman from Illinois and a Republican, Instagrammed a photo <laughs> of him with Ariana Grande, like a couple hours before the American Music Awards. And it's just a selfie of the two of them hanging out somewhere, I guess, and him saying, good seeing you today. Good luck at the AMAs. Do you know anything about that? Are they friends? Are, we should look into this. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> I was floored. I mean, I mean, like, I didn't know what that was about. It was, it was very interesting. Not what I would have expected. Oh, just be straight with me. Are you looking into this right now? Am I going to wake up to a Betsy Woodruff blog post that just, like, <laughs> runs no, down? I, don't, I, I have no plans to I have no plans to cover this. I don't have any hot scoops <laughs> or intel. Um, but caught my eye. It's interesting. Just, just something... I I, to- I totally missed it, but now it's all I can think about. You should look it up. It's really amazing. It's like mm-hmm. it's obviously Ariana Grande, obviously Aaron Shock, just like hanging out. Wait, it's and is it clear from this um, um, this post that he knows? It's who- unclear it- the nature of their relationship, but mm-hmm. it, I mean, it didn't look like he waited in line to shake hands with her or something. It looks like they're at a coffee shop or something. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. It's, it's not like he's at the Wax Museum, like, hi, Ariana Grande. It's intriguing to me. Um, God, I scooped you on that. I'm really proud of myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't have told me anything and just written the definitive story on this and <laughs> all my, my traffic on this. God damn it. Oh, well, I'm next time. Messed up. Next time. Um, well, speaking of Hollywood and celebrities... Your segues are so good. So good, I know. I'm really good at them. <laughs> Speaking of Hollywood and celebrities, uh, let's talk about the Star Wars trailer. Oh, right. The, uh, for episode seven, The yeah. Force of... Yeah. What was your gut reaction? What was your, what was your emotional as, response? As someone who covers entertainment and uh, film, this is going to sound like sacrilege, maybe, but I really don't really give a shit about Star Wars. <sighs> I know. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Are you ending this Turning right? Turning this off. I gotta go. I have a thing right now. I forgot. I'm, I forgot I had this thing I have to go to. I'm sorry. Like, I, I just... I can't believe you would say that publicly. I know. Just like the entire Star Wars universe, all the, those six films, I don't really see what the big deal is. And I can get into that later in a second. I, I know you... Jaws just dropped to the floor. Um, having said that, J.J. Abrams is intriguing me. The trailer looked pretty cool. I'm definitely going to go see this. I'm not sure I'm going to fanboy over it as much as everybody else. Um, I, I, I find it... Dead to me. Like, uh, yes, that. But I hope you can agree with me that it's unendingly hysterical that J.J. Abrams has been given both the Star Wars reboot and previously the Star Trek reboot. I know very little about J.J. Abrams. Uh, he's the lost guy, alias. Okay. He did Mission Impossible 3. Okay. Um, and yeah, he was the guy tasked with re- resurrecting both Star Trek and now Star Wars. And, Seems a little uh, incestuous. 
Yeah. Yeah, like, I, you shouldn't give both franchises to the same man. Yeah, like, no then, then they'll start looking alike, and they shouldn't, because they're completely different. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I'm not happy uh, about that. So, so tell me your reaction to the teaser trailer, <sighs> and then lay into me about why I should actually give it <laughs> in. Right. Even though I well, live- well, I, uh, I'm, I have to, I have to be forthright about my bias. I already, I'm confident this movie's gonna suck because when I was writing for NR National Review, um, <coughs> I went to Austin and tried out for Star Wars when they were having a public tryouts. For um, this, really? Yeah. Are I, you like I a, wrote a story it, about it. I, you don't I read me. That. Screw you. Friendship over. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I read some of your stuff when you were. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I went to Austin and tried out. Spoiler, they did not give me a spot, which they were Was this for, an ex- this was for an extra? No, right? they had they had public tryouts for, I think it was two main characters, and they had tryouts in like seven cities, and one of the cities was Austin, and I just pitched it to my editor, I was like, this sounds like something National Review should be covering, and he was like, you were right. Um, so I went and tried out for it, I, they didn't, it, it was not a fun experience. Um... It was, it was hundreds of people, like hundreds of, of kids who thought they might have a chance at being in Star Wars, including this person. Not really. Um, and they just kind of crowd you into this ballroom. Some people came from all over. Like, I, talk, I sat next to one girl who flew in from Sacramento for this. <coughs> there were people who, like, drove hours and hours, like, oh, maybe I'll be able to be in Star Wars. And then everyone sat in this huge ballroom and just, like, waited around for maybe two hours. And then the organizers are like, hi, guys. Yay, Star Wars. We want you all to get in a line and walk past this one casting director and maybe introduce yourself and the casting director is kind of going to look at people and if they flag you, you write your name down on a list. So mm. I, uh, I walked past the casting director and they didn't flag me, probably because of a horrible, really embarrassing oversight. Um, and it was basically a bunch of hours of waiting around for like a 10 second window when you walk past someone. And apparently this is standard operating procedure for these open casting calls, but it definitely felt like a weird publicity stunt to, to gin up excitement, um, and get people talking about the movie, which if so, it worked. Uh, but yeah. And it even got it into the pages of national review. (laughs) Right. Seriously. Kevin did. Which is, is known for its pop culture coverage. Renowned for it. Multiple Star Wars coverage. No kidding. So did anybody in these this wide net of casting calls get cast? Or I, what I'm not sure. I think they might have cast one person, maybe. Mm. Um as soon as they didn't cast me, I just ignored the whole thing. So whatever. Oh, yeah. Um maybe. I, I don't remember. Uh it's possible. Mm-hmm. Unclear. Nobody that I sat next to at the Austin tryouts got casted. So Sure. But the uh But yeah, it was like for a main role. This wasn't like for extras. Mm-hmm. This was talking role character on screen. So very interesting. Well, what, I think what it's gonna be a terrible you... movie. Um but the reason I think it's gonna be because Betsy Woodruff is I am it. really emotionally invested in Star Wars. Uh I my, we weren't huge T V and movie people when I was growing up, but we watched Star Wars all the time. So we, our friendship really is like dead. So our friendship really is on the line. Yeah. Okay. This would be like me being like Daily Beast, people whose last name is Soup saying, whatever. Don't care. Are you a journalist or something? I don't know. I, I can't think of a good analogy. But okay. uh you, This is uh okay. you prefer for me to have said that I don't see what the big deal with Star Wars is or I don't see what the big deal with Jesus is. Like which <laughs> More tough. like a visceral gut. Tough. Life. It's difficult for me to pick. Um, oh. <laughs> no, I love Star Wars. Mm. I it was an important part of my childhood. Uh, formative, I would say. And I loved the I loved the old ones. I loved episodes four, five, and six. And then when the new ones came out, it was just disaster after disaster. All the three new ones totally sucked. They were awful. They were the worst. Indefensible. Yeah. The worst bad movies, mm-hmm. nothing good to say about them, awful. Well, see, at least you agree with me on 50% of this. It's it's just... But no, I don't, because you don't have strong feelings about Star Wars, and I have extremely strong feelings about Star Wars. Just for three of the movies, there's strong feelings of love, and for three of the movies, there's strong feelings of detestment. 
mm-hmm. whereas you are lukewarm. And that's just totally outside my experience. I don't understand that at all. I, I just... I, it never got my blood up the way it did everybody else. I, I when did you when did you first watch Star Wars? What well, order did you like, watch? Them? When I was a kid, when I was everybody like I saw a New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, some point That's in horrible. middle or elementary school, I I don't remember when. And you didn't like them, and you were like, oh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't hate them or anything. So I, weird. Yeah, I I was just like, Do you like Star Trek. Also agnostic on Star Trek. I was like, what movies did you like? Well, my reaction as a kid was, okay, this is okay, but it's no Independence Day. Or it's no Mars Attacks. Like, those movies I love. Independence Day. But, I, I'm or Jura- cool. I like Jurassic Park. Maybe we can agree on Jurassic Park. I didn't watch Jurassic Park when I was little. I didn't watch Jurassic Park till like, high school, and I was underwhelmed. Well... That was awful. Well, and I think less of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but no, just, seriously, you should revisit Independence Day. Yeah. Just, just think of it as like Star Wars, but better. Oh, that'll that'll do it. Yeah. That'll do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to give it as Star Wars, like the new three episodes, but better. Well, this has been that, a delightful that, conversation. Too, yeah. um, <laughs> this has been fun. Uh, uh, I'm glad to learn some new things about you. We should, speaking of childhoods and things that are good, uh, before before starting us, you mentioned that you had some thoughts on, oh, no, this is the segue I want to do. Speaking of wars. <laughs> you know, that's a segue. <laughs> <laughs> segue. <laughs> speaking of wars, okay. let's talk about the war on Christmas. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, or what, what has been. What are. What are your thoughts on the war on Christmas? Are you, do you favor armistice in the war on Christmas? Do you, do you favor further full frontal attack? Uh, Oh, well, here's the thing. Uh, Let's just, first of all, just completely put it out there that what we're talking about is the war on Christmas as it is defined largely by conservative media, more specifically the Fox news apparatus. Um, in terms the Fox News industrial complex. Yes, exactly. Fox News holiday. No, sorry, Christmas complex. <laughs> um, so my position on the war in Christmas, as it has been de- defined for us by people like Bill O'Reilly or Gretchen Carlson or just put X name of Fox News personality there, um, if I'm to take it the way they've illustrated it for me, Uh, It's actually something I'm for. I am passionately for the war on Christmas as it has been defined by the pro-Christmas counter-revolutionaries. Can you unpack that statement a little bit? Absolutely. Um, Usually when you hear uh, right-wing pundits like hollering about the war on Christmas, which I think you and I can agree as reasonable human beings, doesn't exist. Like, there's no actual war on Christmas in terms of like there's no curtailing of religious <laughs> freedom to celebrate Christmas. Christmas is everywhere. It doesn't matter if Macy's or whoever decides to call it a holiday tree. It, I, like, I disagree with you on that point. Really? Because it's not a holiday tree. The point of the tree is Christmas. The, the reason we have trees is because of the Christmas holiday. There is no other holiday that sure. uses pointy green trees. Therefore, okay. it's dumb to call them holiday trees. Here's, here's where I'll disagree with you, right? On the one hand... I, in general, agree as far as terminology. I think it's stupid to throw around the word war and say everything is a war on everything. Right, war on a- Christmas, war on women, war on drugs, war on poverty, war on terror. Like, we, the word war almost no longer means anything, which sure, sucks because that's an like important word and it matters. Like and it should have a very specific, narrow meaning. Just saying war equals criticism of something that I like. I don't like that. I think that's bad news. So I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of this war on Christmas terminology. For the same reason, I'm not a huge fan of the war on drugs terminology or war on terror terminology or war on poverty terminology. Um, that word means a specific thing. It should be used to talk about a specific thing. I don't like, I don't like the dilution of, the, of that term. I would break with you on the war on drugs because the way that's waged internationally, it does sort of have the body count and the gruesomeness of a war. So I, I'll break with you on war on drugs. But I mean, I think part of the reason it has been so gruesome and ineffective is because it's been approached that way. 
because it's it's been treated like something that can be won the way that you win any other sort of actual military conflict. But I, I, right. I, that's yeah. a fair point. Um, but, but but we digress. But we digress. Uh, the larger issue, though, as far as if, if by war on Christmas we mean using language that's more inclusive to people who are not Christians or who don't celebrate Christmas for whatever reason, I don't have a problem with people saying happy holidays. I don't have a problem with clerks at grocery stores doing that. I do think I do think there's a point where this gets dumb, though. When you start calling it a holiday tree instead of a Christmas tree, it's it's explicitly for Christmas. You wouldn't call them holiday ornaments. Like, I understand holiday wreath because wreaths are used for a number, for number of holidays, but, like... Come on, I just think it's dopey. I think I think sure. there's a point where it gets if, ridiculous and absurd and you know, it's it's not my issue. My my blood pressure doesn't go up, but it's dumb. It's like nobody feels better because you because you called something a different term than it actually is. I mean, if I really want to troll you right now, I could talk about how the tree as a symbol predates Christmas and oh, Christmas. Well, you're right. Of yeah, course. and that but, it, but the it, entire it's Christian fuel tradition. All the festival of lights, like I mean, I, I well, could I could deploy that. That wouldn't be trolling me. That wouldn't upset me. You're right. Like, okay. and that's why we celebrate Christmas in December when, according to the New Testament, Jesus was probably born in the springtime. Um, obviously, it's because early Christians took pagan traditions and baptized them mm. and co-opted <coughs> them, appropriated them, whatever term you want to use, to. For their holiday. They said, okay, right. people have these holidays. We don't want to take these people's holidays away. Let's make them Christian. And that's why we have all these pagan traditions intermingled with, uh, in Christianity and in, and in Christian traditional celebrations. So mm -hmm. it's not trolling. That's, I mean, that's historically accurate, but no, but people aren't celebrating those pagan traditions anymore, except for, you know, a small number of practicing pagans in the United States. But I, I don't I, think, they're, I, but I don't think, I don't think people are calling them holiday trees because of the significant number of pagan Pagan practicing pagans who need to buy trees for their holiday winter that solstice celebration. I mean, but not to dodge your earlier question. I just want to get this out uh, there before we have to wrap up. The, the reason I phrase it is, uh, yes, I'm for the war on Christmas, <laughs> is because, yes, even though I agree with you, I mean, if you call it a holiday tree, I, even I sometimes roll my eyes Screw at that. Screw you for calling it a holiday tree. That's so stupid. But at the same time, you have to examine the reasons of why corporations and companies decide to do that. It's mm -hmm. because they've taken a stance that it, it makes better, more economic sense to them to even in a stupid, small, verbal, linguistic way to be more inclusive of the good number of Americans who are not Christian, who are Hindus, who are atheists, who are Muslims, who are Jews. And they're deploying these happy holidays statements and decor redecorating their storefronts for the entire month of December, if not longer than that, if not through mm -hmm. November. And Christmas is only one, if at best, two days of December. So it is also... Dude, Christmas is three months now. That's <laughs> seven, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you think about Christmas it, is only two days of December, said someone who has never worked in retail. Mm, right. No, I, I meant the calendar... Holiday, right. whatever. Just, just <laughs> the season of Advent oh, is much longer, though. Advent's like four weeks. Sure. Traditionally, that's how much time Christians spent observing Christmas. Well, oh, okay. Bam. Yeah, I, I, I win. One I, point from Betsy. I think that was supposed to school me in some way, but <laughs> or how? Uh, so, if you look in that way, this war on Christmas element from a corporate standpoint, or from the corporate perspective, is about capitalism and inclusiveness. Two things which I'm for, even though I I'm... I know you're for capitalism. I know, I'm a filthy liberal. What kind of... What kind Mother, of, Mother uh, Jones, I hope Mother Jones fired you. I hope they found out you're for capitalism. It was over... Like, it was... Out. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, out, you fascists. For, <laughs> I like for Nazis, too. <laughs> I like how we bring this full circle to Nazi at the end. You would definitely go find a way. <laughs> the other element, the other front on the two-front war on Christmas uh, is whenever the ACLU or someone like them, or an atheist organization, files a lawsuit, mm -hmm. or they go to a public space where there is a Christmas tree. Or oh my god, I have an amazing story on this, by the way. And, yeah, and, and they erect something like... I have uh, literally... Can I tell you my story on this? Because this is this is the best story. This is I don't know what you're about to say, but this story is better than it, okay? Okay, but... Uh, you, might, you can finish your sentence, and then I'm going to tell you my story, and then, and then we'll call it a day. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Uh, my thing was just about, like, Satanism shrines and, like, Festivus bowls, like last year. Oh, yeah, I can top that. Yeah, please, top it. 
Okay, so I'm from Northern Virginia, from Loudoun County, and my family used to live in the town of Leesburg. Now we live in a town about 20 minutes outside Leesburg. Leesburg, Virginia is a bucolic town. It goes back to Revolutionary War days. George Washington spent one evening there. It's in wine country, Virginia. Very affluent community, extremely affluent. Um, downtown Leesburg is, is very quaint. At Christmas, they have beautiful wreaths everywhere. Uh, the courthouse is the centerpiece of downtown Leesburg. Across the street is a really great restaurant that Redskins players go to. Bucolic, you know, wine bars, bougie, fancy, upscale, mm. nice place. And I forget if it was the ACLU or some atheist organization, but traditionally there was like a nativity scene in front of the courthouse. And someone pressed Loudoun Cap, pressed the, the Leesburg courthouse to say, look, you need to be more inclusive of other religions. So the city council, I think it was the city council, said, okay, here's what we're going to do to be more inclusive of other religions. We're going to designate maybe 10 spots on the courthouse lawn that anyone can claim to set up a holiday display. And it'll be first come, first serve. You claim a spot at whatever meeting where the spots were designated, you can, you can set up your display. So, and, you know, they thought this would lead to a really beautiful multicultural display. Maybe you'd have a, a menorah in one spot. Maybe you'd have some sort of Kwanzaa display in one spot. Maybe you'd have a really nice nativity scene. Very tasteful, very multicultural. Would fit with the aura of downtown Leesburg. Um, it, you know, that'd be really nice. Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> the spots that got claimed were claimed. Were, it was insane. The courthouse looked psycho. There were, like, three random nativity scenes. There was also a Star Wars exhibit, May the Force Be With Our Troops, that was set up by people who claimed to be Jedis. Stop. There were also a whole bunch of atheist exhibits that were like, being a Christian is stupid. We're celebrating Zeus holiday. Ha! You shouldn't believe in God. A bunch of signs that obviously <laughs> had nothing to do with holidays that were just atheists being assholes. And then the best thing was, oh, there was another person put up a sign that was a letter from Jesus on a parchment <laughs> scroll that said something like, dear people, I wish you all would stop fighting. I wish you would just be happy in December and be nice to each other. Love comma Jesus but the best part was this it was a skeleton wearing a Santa suit and a Santa hat crucified on a cross literally a Santa Claus skeleton <laughs> being crucified and just young want... children were terrified D parents complained it was a hellscape the, the skeleton Santa was put up by some mother-son duo who thought it was a really smart thing to say about consumerism so... and how the true spirit of Christmas has been killed it gets better people started defacing the skeleton Santa <laughs> angry Leesburg residents would tear it down Me like or when it's posts online, you need to include at the bottom the link to the definitive write up. Yeah, maybe I'll do that this year because oh, yeah, it's I don't I don't know what Leesburg is doing this holiday season. I don't know if we can expect more crucified skeletons. Oh my god! Like actually, Merry uh, Christmas! Everything you described, I'm for. That sounds like the best use of public space I can think of. Like short of the Pope installing, like, showers for the homeless in the Vatican. Like, this is, that is awesome. That's about free expression. It's about art. It's about the free marketplace of ideas. <laughs> and it's about not giving Christianity a monopoly on our public space. The May the Force Be With Our Troops this holiday season was, like, written in Star Wars font. <laughs> And insane. and I bet you're definitely for that. See, you know, the war uh, on Christmas bringing everyone together. 
Woohoo! <laughs> Hooray! America! Well, this has been delightful. Uh, thank you for coming on, Swin. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. And uh, I'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye.